Hi, everybody, and welcome to another session in our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas. I'm your host today, and today we are in the ladies' room. And you know, the ladies' room is that place where women talk about things that we might not say just anywhere, you know, things that we can only say to one another because. Well, you know, because we've all had some shared experiences, and this is our opportunity to talk about it, maybe vent some frustrations, and, and give advice to one another, and come away with some new ideas or validation. You know, we like to say that in the ladies' room, we go there. Now, our session today lasts for around an hour. If you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our panelists and our attendees alike. Questions and comments are always welcome. And if you have something that you'd like to say that maybe you want to say anonymously, just put it in the chat to me and I'd be happy to share it for you. So our topic today in the ladies room is how women handle conflict or don't. And there's a lot of conflict management and resolution styles. And often society assumes that gender plays a role in whatever style that you use. So I kind of wanted us to Take a look at that and see if this was true or if it even really matters. So joining me in the discussion tonight are four fabulous women. First, I have Sheila Netty of the Women's Wealth Empowerment Project. Sheila, wave your hand so everybody knows who you are. We have Catherine Matisse of Civility Partners. Wave your hand, Catherine. We have Lori Campbell of LAC Solutions. Lori, make yourself known. <laughs> Hello. And then we have Deborah Thorne, the information diva. Wave your hand, Deborah. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and you know, whether you actually work in the field of conflict resolution or conflict management, we as professional women have all encountered it in our work or in our personal relationships. And if you're like me, Sometimes you've handled it better than other times, right? But in any event, we all have an experience with it. And what comes with experience? Opinions, right? So everyone here has an opinion about how to man manage conflict, things we wish we had done differently, looking for some tips and ideas. So without any further ado, there you go. We're going to talk about how women handle conflict. So. Whoever wants to start us off, go for it. We're handling well, conflict, I, but not talking. <laughs> I started to say, yeah. that's one way. Well, <laughs> I, I find it's interesting. Um, and when, I, when we discussed this, or we brought up this kind of topic, I was thinking that it was interesting to think, um, you know, I come from a corporate world before I started my own business. So I think I handled things you know, of course, we learn as we get older, of course, but I, I handled things uh, less emotionally when I was in the corporate world. When I started my own business and it, was, it, it became more personal and I found that I became a lot more emotional in a, in, in a conflict situation. And I, I, th I think that's quite interesting as we you know, if we're in a corporate, we're representing a company uh, that we're not, you know, personally um, owning, mm -hmm. we do handle things differently. And I thought that might be a good thing to discuss. I, I think I handled, of course, we all think that, but I think I handled conflict very well in the corporate environment. But, but I'm a very, when you were talking about um, gender differences, I'm a very logical woman. And I always have been my whole life. So if I can back up whatever the disagreement is. And I was always great at documenting what was said or what, you know, what the, the discussion or the disagreement might be. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have any issues back then, but as soon as I started my own business and people were, you know, kind of making me feel like they were questioning me mm -hmm. rather than my business. It was a whole different, it's a lot more emotional. It was a lot harder for me to, to deal with than it was previously. Yeah. It's easy to take things personally when it's your own. And I, even with sales, if somebody says no, it's like they just rejected you and um, instead of your service that you were selling. But I actually, your um, 
comment about being emotional and stuff kind of reminds me of a story. So I have a friend who's a professor at San Marcos, UC San Marcos. And um, she was telling me a story about how she was in a faculty meeting and she, it was kind of like this big thing that they were talking about in the meeting and there was kind of sides. Some, some people wanted one thing, some people wanted the other. And so as sometimes arguments do in meetings, you know, it turns out that my friend um, sort of took the lead on being on the one side and somebody else in the room took the lead on the other side of the issue. Mm -hmm. And so it ends up being the two of them kind of being the spokespeople. And she said that she felt pretty attacked. This person was getting really aggressive with her and she felt attacked. And in addition to being passionate about whatever it was they were talking about, she's feeling a little threatened and she started crying in this meeting. And of course, you're not supposed to be emotional at work. This is one of those, you know, it's a masculine world we live in, no crying in baseball, no crying at work. And um, so versus the other person who was being aggressive, which is a more masculine way to be, right? And the, the other person was a woman, but still more, mas more masculine mm -hmm. thing. Anyway, um, so they had this argument, whatever. The next day, my friend gets called into the dean's office and the dean tells her the way that she reacted in the meeting was inappropriate and unprofessional and she should not have cried. And she said, fair enough, you know, never feels good to cry in front of people. You know, I feel embarrassed that I did that. But did you also talk to the other person about the, the way they were acting? No, what's wrong with how they were acting? And I just wow. I think that's a great story that epitomizes um, this, what, what you're saying around emotions and women and how we handle things. And, and we're, we're not supposed to be emotional at work. Um, and uh, I'll just go off topic a little bit before I let somebody else talk. I, you know, I'm a subject matter expert in bullying at work and toxic work environments. And I do think uh, and have been talking a lot lately about the fact that the way to prevent harassment is to make room for emotions because um, it's very emotional to be harassed and it's very um, vulnerable place to be in to tell HR or whoever about it. And so really, you know, and I know that's not what we're here to talk about, but just we are so not allowed to have emotions at work, but then we want people to be vulnerable and emotional and tell us about something like harassment. So unless there's room for emotions at work, that problem is never going to be solved either. Yeah. I have to say, um, in agreeing with Lori on her perception of corporate, I had the same thing in corporate, I, you know, and it's like you don't cry. I mean, I never cried at work. That was not an option. Yeah. Um, and you're logical and you, um, and so you basically, you know, shift in a way to be on the masculine side in order to excel, in order to survive, in order to move forward. Um, and uh, I remember a woman, um, sorry, it comes to me as a woman who was becoming a, who became a partner at an accounting firm. And she basically found that when she would go to the boardroom, because now you know we want to go to the boardroom in these larger organizations, and she was basically talked over. The guy, you know, one of the men would just talk over her, and so what she ended up doing was she did, you know, no, no crying. That's not an option, right? She basically shifted, got a little louder, but also made the point of making it clear that she was not going to leave her power space, mm -hmm. um, and I think that that can that shifted it in that moment a bit and that also showed this you know the ceo that she was going to stand her ground mm -hmm. um and there have been articles i've read and 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 her um understanding that women sometimes when they get to that higher level get quiet like they don't stand in their power they don't they took power to get there but then when they get there it's harder to you know play in this you know all boy, all boys club kind of thing where now you're you're supposedly now with the top levels and you are there, but they're not hearing you. And so, um, and so of course, you know, you get that name of, well, you know, she's being a bitch and be, you know, the B word and everything else and that. And, and yet women aren't allowed to be aggressive in the sense we look down on people being aggressive, but the only way sometimes to move into those higher positions is to be aggressive, but not necessarily hostile. Yeah. Right. So, um, and so I think that that's something that, uh, we as women, if you're moving into that top level, you really have to think about, it's important to be, you know, 
aggressive, I think, or at least it, I shouldn't say aggressive might be the wrong word, but basically you need to show your power and be powerful, mm -hmm. but at the same time, Strong, not yeah. hostile. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Do you guys find that you have um, different responses in conflict, uh, maybe depending on who's in the room or what the topic is or how invested you are in it? Because um, I can think of, of just across the, the span of my career, whether it was in corporate or in my own company, sometimes my response was fear, you know, like, you know, getting really afraid or getting really, really pissed off, just super pissed off or wanting to cry or being so pissed off that I want to cry, you know, <laughs> um, or then, you know, down to just being super silent in it. So is that what, what you guys have experienced as well? Or do you have one, one go to everything is like zero to 60. I'm pissed off and cry. <laughs> I think, I think probably I gauge the opportunity or what not what's what am i looking for gauge the cost of being too emotional you know i do a lot of public speaking to build my business i'm you know very passionate about what i think about how things should be in the workplace um but then if i have a client that's pushing back on me in certain ways you know then i'm gonna um gauge how much I can really kind of say, no, this is how it has to be versus other clients, you know, and I know that maybe not true conflict, but it, it could be, I guess. Um, so I, I, I think we always, all of us probably do that in some way. It's just like what you kind of calculate in your mind, what, what are the options here and how much damage am I going to cause if I get too loud or not and, yeah. uh, or get too pushy or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think, you know what, I'm sitting listening and my take on this is all very different, uh, primarily because my, most of my conflict resolution work is with children and teaching them another way to do it so that when they get to be grown, they're not doing this stupid stuff I'm hearing you guys have to put up with. Okay, it's ridiculous. The other, other thing is, as the information diva, I work teaching women to do business like women not like men, okay? So I don't like it that you feel you got to pull up your jock strap higher than his because you're defeating the whole purpose, okay? We're then saying that a woman has no place in the workplace because if she can't imitate being a man, she can't be there. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's not what this is like, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so when I, I'm thinking in terms of that, I'm thinking in terms of, what am I telling young people? What am I telling uh, young men? What am I telling young women about how we interact with one another? You know, I always tell folks with dignity and respect always, I can be very firm with you without yelling at you or demeaning you, okay? Mm -hmm. But I can get my point across. And so if I'm teaching children to do that certainly grown people got to figure it out this is ridiculous um two things that people argue about 99 percent of the time feeling disrespected and feeling not heard and that's all you guys described and i don't know you, you got me I'm, i got some conflict happening right now <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, bro, i'm in hr you'd be amazed at the things i adults do and yeah <laughs> I know I have a girlfriend who's a, a director. But that's she not. Says, you ought to come in here. That's not a man that versus with woman kids. thing. What with with the 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 foolishness that goes on? I, okay, so let me own this. I have never worked in a corporation a day in my life. I'm a bureaucrat. Now ask me about bureaucracies and how they work. I can tell you that all day long. Cause see, bureaucracies have cures for all of that. Everybody can be brought down. Nobody owns anything. Okay, so. This madness is like, mm, mm -mm. <laughs> I'm having issues. Well, the one thing I wanted to say um, as well, based on what you're saying, Deborah, is that um, one of the things that I noticed is that what made me a good leader in the group was my intuition. Now, did I share that with anybody or say it out loud? Or, um, but I know that bringing that in to allow me to make better decisions and to probably more so than my peers who are all male, um, as far as a management level, bringing in all of my uh, key people to get their opinion and coming out with a decision as a whole. And when there was conflict, getting the full story from everyone and having them to have a voice 
mm. was really the key. So that being heard was definitely something that I incorporated in everything I did. Um, and of course, I do that now in my wealth coaching as you know, with my clients. But in that, in those environments of the corporate, that was not done that much, where you actually brought people in and you actually heard everyone and everybody felt heard and felt safe enough to, to voice their opinion mm-hmm. so that you could get the full story of what was going on so you could come up with a game plan to resolve it. I think that's probably the thing that um, is maybe not looked into, but I agree with you. You need to bring the feminine in because I did, but I did it in a way that was probably not obvious to anybody else other than the people who worked for me to some degree. Um, and so I think that maybe that's something that we need to maybe look at how to bring that knowledge higher, like to get people to understand that that's really what's at play yeah. is bringing in those other areas and not just, you know, stomping on people, so to speak. Yeah, because what, what's coming to me for real and my real concern, you know, I joke about a lot of it, but what are we teaching our girls? We're telling them that they can go and be anything they want to be and go get all this education and do all this stuff. And then we're at the same time, what I'm hearing you say is, yeah, but she got to play it like a boy, you know, um, two words I'm trying to discourage women from using because of that kind of stuff, the word busy and the word overwhelmed. Those are not words that guys use. So quit using them and do it another way. We're not bossy, we're leaders, you know, all that kind of foolishness. But when I'm telling young people that and trying to prepare them and give them a voice and teaching them how to express themselves in a respectful and dignified way, but don't say yes when you mean no. Mm -hmm. And then you're telling me that if they manage to get to the higher echelons of corporate, they got to go back to the stuff that I just told them they don't ever have to do in life. No, that's not at all what we're saying. Okay, okay help us out because that's what I. Okay, so here we go. Well, no, I, I that's think that's what I hear. I th- right, yeah. yeah, well, that's yeah, and that's part of most conflicts is the interpretation of what someone is saying, right? Okay. And I, I still believe, and and of course, I came from a corporate environment, and just like there's no place for the the, the high level of emotion that makes maybe a woman cry or makes a woman clam up or makes a man clam up or get angry to the point where he's screaming or, you know, going in someone's face. I mean, I think the reality is in any business environment, you should behave respectful, like you said, Deborah, respectful and non-confrontational, but get to, you know, what you're saying is, okay, let everyone a chance to, to, to state their opinion. But if, someone in the room is behaving unprofessionally, it's okay to call them on that, mm-hmm. whatever that may translate to. And, you know, it, like you said, it's all about respect. And, and I get, I mean, very frustrated when I'm in a, a business environment and I still do. And a man or a woman starts screaming and, you know, swearing and all the behavior that's not appropriate in a business environment, regardless of what, yeah. sex you are. I agree. And, and I, I don't know that, that any of us were saying necessarily we got to a certain level and realized we had to behave a certain way. I think what it was, was a sharing of an experience that um, you're, you know, you're in. One experience I had was, was so fascinating. And I, I can remember this as if it was yesterday, but we used to have this thing. I, I worked for a, a company in San Diego that, um, and I was part of a senior leadership team. And every month we had what was called line ops. And all of the, the senior managers, senior directors had to go in front of the whole C-level, you know, which were all dudes, and give a status of, of our, our capital projects, big money stuff. And there was only two women in that whole group, myself and the woman I reported to. And during one of the presentations, I was trying to give an update on a project that I was doing. And the COO just attacked me. I mean, he came out with teeth bared, name calling, pounding his desk, you know, yelling, all this ridiculous stuff, ridiculous, over the top, um, over things that were not, uh, there was nothing I could do about them, you know? So, and it was personal attacks. And and so there's probably like 12 people in that meeting. And the men around that table were either, 
okay, whatever, this is business as usual, or they were embarrassed and they were looking down or, you know, it, but not one of them stood up for me or said anything. And, and not that I needed someone to stand up for me. I didn't. What I needed was somebody to say, that doesn't work here. That doesn't fly here. And of course, the gentleman that was doing this, he was a COO and I'm a senior manager. So talk about it, you know, you know, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that, you know, you're, you're going crazy over there, you HR people thinking of that, but. Um, <laughs> but well, the, Patty, I'm, this is, that's the world that I, that's exactly what I fix. I that's what I my consulting business is focused on is helping. Yes. I, I do consulting for those type of people and creating a culture where speaking up and protecting each other is okay. Yeah. Um, but the bottom line is people aren't going to speak up because they don't want to be targeted. Yes, but, and okay, that was that's, the thing. Was that's going bullying. Into, and that's, bullying. Yes, it is bullying. That's that is the bullying. definition. Yeah. Take three bullying. things. That, Absolutely. Three he things that have a bully. A bully, a victim, and a community that tolerates it. And I teach the community, don't tolerate it. Now, he can, he can bully one person, but he can't bully all of us. Yeah. And if we all say, hey, you know what? We don't behave like that. Mm -hmm. When I knew I had gotten through the kids, I overheard a child say to another child, look, I don't know what school you come from, but at this school, <laughs> we don't bully people. And you better not let Miss D hear you. That was me. That was <laughs> awesome. If she hears about it, you're going to be in real trouble. And I went, yes. That's because awesome. The yeah, the community had taken it on. She said, oh, no, we don't bully here. Yep. And that, that's exactly what I have to do. That, that's what I do for a living is go in and teach the community. My daughter's in here. You got little people. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, <laughs> Goodbye, honey. <laughs> but, but actually, the, the, um, I, mean, I, I teach the community how to speak up. They don't, yeah. you know, they don't know how. And they don't, the, the thing is in, they don't feel in a situation safe. like that, they don't know what if HR will be on their side if they're being attacked. And so that, that's my job is to come in and help the culture, you know, heal and help people feel it's okay to in that moment speak up. And that's the work environment I'm working towards is for people to say, hey, you're acting out of, you know, turn. That's not what, how we are here. Right. And that's, that's the bottom line of the goal I'm trying to get to. Well, what was interesting in that, in that situation was, yeah, he's a bully and that's what he was. And that's what he'll be probably till the day he dies because it's worked for him. Exactly. But, but what was yeah. interesting was watching everybody around that table who had different responses to that, including the only other woman who was sitting there. And she just got very, very, very small. You know, she just, she mm. just shrunk into herself. Trying to be invisible so that he didn't turn on her. Those mm -hmm. are victims as well. Those are the oh, vicarious she... victims. Yeah. And they're so afraid to say anything. And that's what, you know, at, what, like I said, working with children, I help empower them. Look, a bully can get one of you, but they can't get three. Come on. All three yeah. pounce at one time and it has to stop. So yeah. Yeah. I always tell in my trainings, I say, look, you're not a bystander. Everybody likes that word. You're not a bystander because that would be passive. You can be a bystander to a car accident. You can't jump in front of the car to keep the cars from smashing. That's a bystander. If you're in a meeting and you witness something like that and you don't say anything, that makes you a reinforcer. And yes, you might also be a victim or a target but you're also a reinforcer because you're mm -hmm. giving permission. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I seem to get a lot of um, kind of like, ah, uh-huh, uh -huh, when I say that. Um, so that seems to resonate with people that, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but the problem is that, you know, then, then they'll come back and say, I, but yes, I understand that, but I don't feel comfortable speaking up because I don't know what HR would do. Would they be on my side? Would my manager be on my side? How much power do we really have? And in school with yeah. kids, um, you know, it sounds like Deborah, we're on the same mission, just at different age levels. And with work, unfortunately, the fear is what if I get bullied or they turn on me and then my livelihood depends on this and um, mm -hmm. the whole. I once another. talked to a parent who was an administrator at a school and his child was being bullied and he was afraid to stand up for his child for fear he would lose his job. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, do you realize what you're telling your son? You're telling him he's not important enough for you to risk your job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was that's like, great. well, no, that's not what I, I said, but that's what you're saying. Mm 
Yeah. You're not yeah. going to defend Action. him, you know, so I don't know. Mm. It, you know what? It boggles my mind how people, the lengths that people will go to, to avoid bullying. So, you know, talk about conflict avoidance. It's a very scary place to be when there's bullying, but I have had companies call and say, we have a bully, you know, one bully. Could you come and do a training on workplace bullying for the whole organization? And I'm like, whole. no, I don't know because I'm going to look like an a-hole and you're going to look like an a-hole because everybody's going to know why I'm there. And that's the one person who's not going to take it in because they Get don't it. think there's anything wrong with their behavior. He'll so be I can that coach day. that person if you'd like. <laughs> But it just, I mean, if you think about what they're really asking, we would like for you to take three hours of our entire workforce's time where they're not doing something useful and instead they're listening to you because of one person. And that feels safer to us than actually addressing the person. I mean, that just still boggles right. my mind when I get yes. that. Right. Like, oh yeah, I, but that's kind I of a coach the one person. <laughs> that's a that's a a classic conflict avoidance technique. Yeah. Is instead mm -hmm. of dealing with somebody one on one for whatever their their bad behavior, their bad performance, whatever, you talk to the whole group instead, and you're hoping to God that that one person understands. Oh, she's talking to me when they and never they do. Happen. No, <laughs> they're no. never the one who gets it. So, you know, but, right. but if you don't, if you really want to avoid that one-on-one -on -one conflict, that's, that's what a lot of, of chicken people do, you know? Yeah. And uh, when you were telling that story, Patty, I was thinking of multiple incidents where I or someone else in a big room like that has spoken up and said, you know what, this is not the play time or place to be doing this kind of discussion you know I always used to revert back to okay what was the point of this meeting what is it we're trying to accomplish and mm -hmm. let's get back on track and you can take that conversation on a one-on-one -on -one offline thing I never understood why people would do that mm -hmm. and then Sheila you made a comment about um women cl maybe clamming up when they got into the boardroom or being quiet. It's funny because I think that, and someone else said, that, oh, I think it was you, Sheila, about being very intuitive. Mm -hmm. I think um, part of the thing when you're in that environment is you have to understand how everybody works, in, you know, just mm -hmm. in general, how they work. Like I am, because I'm so logical, I want to hear all the information before I make a decision. Mm -hmm. And I used to always, it was pretty common for them to say, Lori, you're being very quiet. What, what are you thinking? It's like, well, I don't have all the information yet. You haven't even talked about this thing and th this thing because we haven't gotten to that point yet. But I'm not forming an opinion and providing you with an opinion until I get all the information. You know, and a lot of times that can, like when people start defending their little tiny piece of the puzzle, you can say, well, we need we need to go back to the big picture and what we're trying to do, you know. Mm -hmm. Lori, have you ever taken a DISC assessment? Oh, a million times. Yeah, so that's um, a, like, di like a DISC profile. Yeah, what, what did yeah. you come out, Lori, but when I you am... did it to the big C? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I don't remember. I, you know, I don't, I don't believe in those things um, because I am many things. Like, I could have one day I could have answered those questions completely differently than I did on another day. You know what I mean? You always have to pick one best answer. And I could tell you, I feel like I could answer differently, you know, from one day to the next. So, but I, I know that I'm very logical and I know that's, that, that that's your that, logical, that's your logical piece coming in there, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah of course. Hard. I know they've, they've adjusted a lot lately and I, I'm not DISC certified, but one of my employees is, and we actually use DISC for conflict mediation. So she's a, a, a conflict mediator. She's been doing that a long time. Um, and then she took DISC and she really loves it because she says whatever, you know, if you go to conflict mediation, both parties are not only sort of defending their position, but they're defending what they did or didn't say or I, you know, I'm not like that. One person says, well, you're, you know, too abrasive or whatever. No, I'm not. But then you have the DISC profile. So she said it actually cuts her hours to mediate in half because mm -hmm. it's there on paper. So 
Um, yeah. And so, but one thing it does have, I don't, maybe your assessment didn't have this, is like the natural graph and then it has an adaptive graph. So right. it does account for the fact that like, um, you know, whatever you were doing that day before you took the assessment, you know, is probably affecting how you What's were your circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the, cause That's I good. am certified in disc and the, the thing is, is you have all four styles in you. We all do. Yeah. We, we all have all four. And so depending on the circumstance, we may lean a little bit more to this part of our I or this part of our S for those of you who don't know, it's D I S C. And, um, but you do have kind of a natural tendency to go to something. And, and when I was um, coaching um, poor performers, you know, as a consultant, I would do a disc on them first because it would give me sort of an idea of where their frame of reference came from. And um, mm -hmm. you're right, Catherine, it kind of cut down some of my work immediately by realizing, oh, you know, they probably come from this more you know, less emotional and, and slower paced, methodical corner than they would the passion driven and, and fast, fast paced, you know, corner. It, it helped a little bit. So, yeah. But so what about the rest of you, husband. those of you yeah. that are, that are <laughs> just joining us here, you know, what, what are some of your mm -hmm. thoughts? What have been your experiences in the workplace? Yeah. Marcy, I see you waving your hand. <laughs> Oh, I have some questions for the the group here because I do, I'm an entrepreneur now for six years. I've had my own company, but I come from a corporate background for 15 years. I grew up in the corporate world where I did have a manager and a chain of command and I did have established HR companies where if I felt a conflict with someone, I didn't have to deal with it really mono a mono I could just use the system and <laughs> right and it was it, so for me um now that I ha it, there's no HR there's no manager like if something breaks or something goes wrong if I'm getting bullied I got a deal and I didn't really have that tool set because I just was never given the tools to express myself before something went wrong so question I, I've had some really tough lessons in the last few years of dealing with people that have just steamrolled me and I wasn't prepared for that. So I think um, it would be really useful for me to know what would you suggest if you're feeling maybe there's an inkling of something brewing that could overflow into something like really, really um, poisonous, how would you talk to someone and kind of, you know, stop it before it develops into something more major and toxic? Mm. Good question. Okay, for me, what I would say is, the first thing is to understand how you naturally would handle conflict and try to observe that other person and how they handle it. Because one mm. of the things I teach folks when I'm dealing with adults is, if you know someone else's style, I don't use disc, I, we use animals, but same kind of thing. If you know someone else's style, then I know how to approach you, okay? So, and I, I do know Lori, and she is very methodical. And, <laughs> and if you can come to Lori with logic, you can have the world, okay? But, I know, but, but because I know that, I can come and say, Lori, I did A, B, and C, and I thought I was going to get D, D didn't happen. She can then backtrace it and say, oh, that's because when you did A, you should have done A1, problem solved. It's, a, it's always a data conflict with her. But with other people, <laughs> if you understand how they, how you, first of all, understand yourself and how you deal with conflict, and then if you have a hint about how they do it, it's how you approach them. And I always remind people, people don't feel heard and they feel disrespected. So if you can't approach anybody saying, you know, I heard you the other day when you said X, Y, Z, can you tell me more about that? Many times, and, and we try to break it down to its lowest level of conflict so that you can just nip it there and not have to explode. When people start to explode and keep going as things start to pile on and they don't know how to express it, and you don't know how to express it or receive it, and so kaboom, but yeah. Yeah, and I, I was gonna, and I'd like to add to what Deborah said, and, and I was gonna say, um, one of the things I always go back to, whether it 
whether it, it works in your environment is a whole different thing, but I always document everything and I always document back to someone like, especially if it's someone that I have a feeling there's a potential disagreement or conflict with, I always go back after a discussion, whether it be verbal or whatever, and document it in writing and say, here's what I heard you say. Because what I heard you say may not be what you think you said. You know what I mean? So it's always good, especially for someone that's in, you know, a volatile, perhaps potential volatile situation is to go, I heard it this, here's what I heard you say. And many times I find that's not what they meant, even though that's what I interpreted. Or what they even said. And the other thing is like when you're telling the story, I used to tell young people, you're going to tell me a story, start with what I did. I did X, Y, Z. Well, no, they were yelling at me. No, no, no. Let's start with what did you do? Tell me what you did first. And then we can feed in what they did. So yeah, I don't expect you to walk up to an adult and say, hey, I did. But think about it. What, what was the, the predecessor to it? What did you do? Or how did you respond? How did they react? And then you can kind of map it out. Because as my friend always tells me, the grown people are just children who got bigger and nobody nipped this stuff in the bud. Because a lot of it, <laughs> see, you know, <clears throat> those of us who are of African-American descent, our mamas used to say, I'll slap the taste out of your mouth. There's some people that should have just been slapped in the last year and we wouldn't have to deal with this now. Okay, somebody <laughs> missed it. Oh, I mean, it's part of some. <laughs> they missed I the love it. <laughs> I'll, I'll add to, um, we talk about uh, in a lot of my trainings and the, the ally, not bystander training, um, really assessing what you're afraid of if you are someone who's not willing to speak up, whether it's conflict avoidant or speaking up, like in these meetings we were talking about, like, um, you know, you're, it's fight or flight. So people who steamroll are fighting and people who kind of step away from conflict or fleeing it, which tells you that there's something you're anxious about. And so um, maybe stopping to assess like, gosh, I, I know I should talk to this person, but I don't want to, or I'm afraid to, to kind of, you know, journal maybe a little bit about well, what, what are you really afraid of? And is that really a possibility, whatever it is, or, you know, and kind of regroup and really assess the reality of the situation um, to try to make it more, and, and I guess I am logical too, Lori, make it, look, like, take some of that emotion out of it of just the reaction, and then you kind of look at it all laid out before you, and what am I really afraid of? Is that really going to happen? Probably not. Okay, mm -hmm. I can, you know, and, and sort of, um, make build build up some courage because that's where conflict avoidance comes from sure and a couple of things too, when you were saying that also have to check and be sure the thing that i'm afraid of actually has something to do with the workplace i yeah. might be afraid of something in my life and this just compounds on top of it mm -hmm. and um, you know reminding people that we were only born with two fears the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises everything else you learned so if you learned it, you can unlearn it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, the yeah. thing that, um, that comes to my mind is I actually look at a book. I read a book that I thought was really helpful once I became an entrepreneur because yes, I had the corporate experience, but I'm not managing 300 people. They don't purport to right. be a different story. Mm -hmm. So Crucial Conversations, I don't know if you, yeah. uh, if you, any of you heard that book. Crucial Conversations is an amazing book. It lays out exactly how to manage all sorts of different conflict, um, conversations that can be volatile, conversations where, where you know, as Deborah and, and Catherine talked about, where the person, you don't know what their fears are, what's going on for them, figuring out a way to make it safe for both of you to kind of go through this conversation together. I love the book. So Crucial Conversations. Yeah, Marcy, that's a great referral. And, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, knowing what you do for a living, um, your, your situations are probably going to be like a one-on-one. -on -one. This is you and a client. And, you know, um, sometimes it's like you can see the train coming from a long way off. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, this is going to be bad. I, I should deal with this now, but I don't want to because I need that money or I need, you know, whatever. And, mm -hmm. and one thing I learned um, early on in my own business, when I was running my own business, and I share this with people all the time now, is, Bad news does not get better with time. 
That's a good one. I like that. Bad news <laughs> does not better with time. <laughs> it serves you in so many situations. So mm -hmm. figuring out a way that you can deal with it, you know, as, as soon as you can kind of heads off that, that, uh, that collision. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah. But I also think, uh, you know, I also think that recognizing, and, and you're, this is probably going to surprise you all that know me that I'm going to say this, but when you're in an emotional state, it's okay to avoid those conversations that are going to push you yes. over that yeah. emotional, yeah. you know, like Deborah said, so you don't know what's going on, but you do know what's going on with yourself. Mm -hmm. And so... I, I mean, I'm going to tell you this story when I, one of the first thing I did when I got out of corporate and I was in big corporate, um, but when I got out and bought, I, the first thing I did was buy a, a franchise and I was struggling with this franchise. And I, I think I should write a book about why not to buy one or what to, you know, <laughs> what to look for, at, you know, all these lessons learned. So, uh, but I got in a confrontation with the owner, uh, the parent company of the franchise basically telling me that my my franchise was failing because of me because i wasn't doing all the right things and i i felt so you know i could feel the emotions like building up in me and i knew if i opened my mouth tears were going to come out of my eyes and i couldn't speak you know and i said i just said to him it was a one on one in a in a at a conference somewhere and i said i need to step away and that's all i said like I knew I couldn't have that conversation right then. I had to, you know, go away, you know, me go away and think about it and then, you know, get ready. But I think no, but it's very I valuable for that. us to recognize I that. that. I really do. I love that because on the, on the side of, um, of us saying that women should just rush into the fray and not be afraid and own our space and do all those other things. So take the woman part out of it. This is, this is advice I give to any of my students when I'm teaching team development or leadership is never be afraid to just walk away. You need to recognize when you are not in control of your emotions or you don't have all of the facts that you need or whatever, and not just rush into that and say, I, I need to step away. That's a, that's a brilliant little tool to have in your toolkit. Cause you know, I'll tell you, I, I have, gone ahead and pressed ahead when I knew in my knower, you know, they say, you know, in your knower, this is not a good thing to be doing right now. You should just shut your mouth and walk away, but you press ahead and it never ends up well. So to say, I, I need to step away from this right now is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Good one, Lori. And who else? Who have we not heard from? There's a wealth of, of experience sitting out there. <laughs> um, I'll give a little background. I'm Faith. Nice to meet you all. Uh, I recently started my own recruiting business last March for mostly technology recruiting. Um, I've been in the corporate world. I've been most recently working for startups. And um, I seem to keep finding myself working with these men, helping them build their companies <laughs> instead of focusing on mine. So I'm, you know, it's been a process yeah. trying to figure out why I keep falling into that situation. And, and that's kind of my current situation now. I'm trying to build my recruiting company organically and doing some part-time consulting for a Salesforce implementation partner. Um, what I want to uh, talk about is just uh, one of you ladies hit on you know, the masculine versus the feminine. And in my last relationship, I wanted to, um, you know, I knew it was at an end and I wanted to break it off in a respectful and loving way. And I just happened to meet this lady at a networking event who calls herself the love coach. And so we went through this series of sessions um, and I learned a lot about myself. And I think the biggest thing Somebody mentioned that, you know, as women, we are feminine. That's, that's what makes us powerful and confident and, and the successful women that we are. And because of, you know, my divorce situation, being a single mom starting from 2004, I, she said, Faith, you're constantly in your masculine 
you're, you're forgetting, you, you're so out of balance right now. And she goes, and I get it because you've had to raise three boys. You had to be the father and the mother. Um, and so when you go into these situations, you're not aware that you're almost completely forgetting your feminine and that's your power. That's your essence. That's what makes you the amazing woman that you are and the nurturer and the relationship builder and, you know, the, the understanding person and the voice of reason in the room. And so I really had to sit with that and just, okay, you know, try to be more aware of, so what, what is the feminine side of me? Because at some point I think I had forgotten what that looks like. Cause I'm so tough and I got to discipline my boys and I got to show up and, you know, and of course in the world of technology, there's not a lot of women. It's gotten better, <laughs> but I walk, go to a networking event and like there's me and one other lady in the room, you know, and the rest of it suits. So um, it's been quite a journey. And I think um, just, even now, the issue of pay has come up twice with the one person that I'm consulting with. And um, what you were saying, Patty, was walk away. And so I did that today. You know, we're on an hour conversation discussing he wants to reduce my pay to half. And um, so it's almost like he expected me to give him an answer, right? On, and I was like, I'm going to need some time to think about this. I, I will let you know when I'm ready to answer, but I'm going to need some time. And, you know, I said it confidently, respectfully. Um, and at first he got a little flustered and then he was okay with it. So <laughs> I was like, okay, okay, that's a win. Mm -hmm. I think I've, um, I've gotten, had the habit of if I feel uncomfortable about something, rather than saying, hey, let's talk about it, I will put it in letter form or email form and then have a conversation. And I would love your guys' opinion on this. Okay. Is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? I think it's Because I feel like I'm avoiding the conversation, but then I'm like, no, I'm putting it out there and then I'm asking for a call. That way they know the, like, the expectations are set and we can, you know, I haven't forgotten anything that I want to say. So, yeah. Okay. I think that's, that's great. I used, Thank to, you for I used listening. to do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I used to do that quite a bit as well. I think that's great because it gets your, your, your thoughts in writing and mm -hmm. can, they can't be misinterpreted necessarily. And yes. you don't forget the key points. Yep. Exactly. And I think, you know, part of when you were talking, I, I, I thought one of the things that uh, made me very successful in the in the corporate world is possibly a, a thing that's more feminine is that I was always able to say, I was in the technical arena as well. And mm -hmm. um, I worked for IBM for um, almost 30 years. And I was always one of the only women in the room in the beginning, not towards the end. IBM was like a great yeah. company for women and, and that kind of thing. But um, I was, unlike my many of my male counterparts, I was able to read m the person I was talking to or explaining something to and explain something so that they, that person could mm -hmm. understand it. So my intuitive ability uh -huh. to understand that person and read that person, which, um, so I think that the feminine traits that we do have that are very valuable, we should embrace and recognize. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's part that's of what you said, you know, don't intuition. Don't that for sure. Down. Yeah. 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 And Faith, I don't think that's that's chickening out by putting it in writing first because you follow it up with the conversation. So and right. just the process of writing it down sometimes helps you go, Yeah, that's not what I meant. That's not, you know, yeah. yeah. And so you're changing exactly. it you go, but then having the conversation after, I think it's brilliant. I think, you know. And kudos to Thank you, <laughs> raising boys. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, it's, it's been a journey, but yeah, I love my boys. And you know what? If they, if they have made me tougher. Um, and, you know, just being, I think, uh, being able to shift and, and deal with the masculine as well as being in my feminine. So it's, yeah. it's been mm -hmm. a great experience. You've probably impacted them and they'll be more... I don't know what the word is, accepting or something of the feminine in them yes. and, and others. I, Faith, I have to ask, was your coach Catherine? Was her name Catherine? Was what? Was your coach, was her name Catherine? 
No, actually, oh. the craziest thing, I mean, I don't believe in coincidences, but her name is actually Imuna, which means faith in Hebrew. So <laughs> we sat right next to each other at a networking event, and I gave her my business card. She was like, what? Is it Imuna? <laughs> I, I know, like, Catherine is a love coach, so I had to ask. <laughs> oh, is it Amuna, okay. Mal- Amuna Malinovich? Yes. She's, you know her. She's incredible. <laughs> she's she? just like an earth oh. mama. Yeah. Oh, love- yes. We had some like major, okay. major crying healing sessions. Yeah. You guys need to tell her that she just got a free commercial. On yeah. This. <laughs> yeah. I will tell her. Yes. I've sent a lot of people her way just because she's, it, honestly, um, I, I, you know, we talk about just layering, layering, layering on this stuff that's holding us back, whether it's relationships or, you know, regret, um, loss. And so it was really intense, but I felt like just this weight was lifted from me and I could be the person I'm supposed to be, mm-hmm. you know? So it was, it was amazing. Yeah. Hey, small I, world. Christine, <laughs> I see you, uh, Christine's lurking out there without her camera on. And I, and Christine's <laughs> always got an opinion about stuff. And, uh, <laughs> she's a, she's a real brilliant smarty pants. So, Christine, is there anything you want to contribute to the conversation or, or add to it? No, um, <laughs> I, someone, no, no, there was, so, I think it was Lori that mentioned that when you are feeling emotional, it's okay to not say anything. And this is just bringing up a lot of experiences in corporate that I'm no longer a part of. So I'm just listening. <laughs> <laughs> And taking it all in before you form an opinion. Yes. Yes. (laughs) You know, so, so that's interesting that you said that Lori about um, your style being that you take all the information in before you, you form an opinion. And I am very much that way as well. So if we're talking about a disc spectrum, I am a CS, but when I went to work at Autodesk, when I moved up to the Bay area in 2012, I came up to work for Autodesk. And very interesting corporate environment, a really awesome company, but, but it was a very interesting environment where you needed to speak up all the time. That was how you claimed your place, whether you were a man or a woman or whatever, that was just the culture there. And I came to work for a gentleman and, and he, he, did, he gave me one of the biggest gifts ever when, during some of my early days there, my first week or so there. He said, tell me what you're like in a meeting. And I said, well, I tend to sit and listen a lot. I take everything in. And then if I have something meaningful to contribute, I speak up. If I don't, I don't. And he said, I would advise you to not do that. I would advise you to say something, whether you're adding to it or not. And it was so counter my style, but it was very much a part of that culture. It was kind of like the last voice in the room wins kind of thing. And hmm. it was, uh, it was very, it was a very interesting, very interesting place. And what he shared with me in that, those first few days of me working there proved to be correct the entire time I was there, you know, the whole, the whole length of my tenure there. Yeah, I, I agree with you there that, that it can be a problem, and especially if you, the meeting runs long, you never get to say anything because <laughs> you're waiting. <laughs> I used, I still do, but I have a very readable face. So even though I wasn't saying anything, apparently my face was. <laughs> so I would get called on and say, Lori, do you have something to add? I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. But I feel like that's a very masculine way of approaching a situation because I, I think if I don't have anything that's going to elevate or add to the conversation, then I'm just adding right. noise. And that's what I feel like on social media, everybody has an opinion. And I'm like, could you please show me your degree? Or could you please, you know, are you a doctor? Or are you doing research? Because if not, I don't want to hear from you. And I feel <laughs> like we're trained in the social media world now that, it, you know, we have to add, add, add to the conversation or we're not relevant. Or like, you have to post so many times a week. I feel, I just feel like that adds to the culture of, um, bullshit noise. And noise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I really, really resonate with people that add something that's meaningful and that will elevate and like teach me something. And if you're not, I'm going to tune you out. And I don't know if it's masculine or feminine, but 
I think we're taught that. And I, and I agree, like in the work culture, I think you're like, Oh, I got to say something or else I'm going to be considered irrelevant, but you could be the wisest person in the room and just say one thing mm-hmm. and it's just the same. Yeah. When I worked there, I, I started, I mean, I, I was glad he shared that with me so that it gave me an insight into what the culture was there but I used to share with, with people sometimes that this was the pile-a-thon mentality. It was like, I'm just going to pile on what was the last thing said. Oh, no, I got to pile on to that. And then, oh, no, let's yeah. pile on to that. Just so you're the last voice in the room. That's ridiculous. And, wow. and I think that might be a, maybe that's a female quality. I mean, Catherine, you, you tell us, but that says, there's no, this doesn't make any sense. There's no, I'm not adding any value to this. And you're certainly not adding any value to this. So why don't you just stop talking? You know, I think it's a couple of things. It's just a corporate culture thing because not all companies are like that, you know, even right. if they're full of men. So that was just the way it had gone and had developed over time. Um, but, you know, there there is a lot of research that, for example, um, and Deborah, you probably have seen some of this or know about this, too, is like um, the researchers will sit in classrooms and and watch teachers interact with kids. And if the little boy interrupts. Um, the teacher will, you know, still kind of react or respond to that little boy. But if the little girl interrupts, it's like, shh, don't interrupt, you know, and so they're treated Mm -hmm. differently for the same exact behavior. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that I think that's, uh, so maybe in some ways it is masculine to interrupt or feel like you have to have the last word. And it's also one of the reasons women make less. We tend to be relationship oriented and we want to please and so we have an idea in our head about what we want to make when we go into negotiations and we're just more inclined because we've learned to be a people pleaser. Like, okay, the, I guess that's all right. We sort of undervalue ourselves or well, I'll only, yeah. you know, only if I have something meaningful to say. And so we're sort of cutting ourselves short versus maybe we have something meaningful to say, but we're not mm-hmm. saying it. So no one's going to hear it or whatever. <laughs> You know, Catherine, when you started in with that, I was I agree. Um, we the the message we send to little girls and the message we send to little boys is very different. But I'm gonna throw something else in there. The message we give to African American boys is still something different. They are no longer mm. cute after age eight. And so after age eight, anytime they interrupt, the whole world comes apart. They're somehow deviant and have to be put out of the room or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder how how much of this stuff is really unconscious. People just do what they saw Mm -hmm. done and they just keep doing it. And I think, again, this is where those of us who know better, know more, have to learn to speak up and say, you know, I, I remember very plainly, my son was about 11 or 12 and we got into an elevator and this woman came in the elevator after us and she grabbed, she looked at my son and grabbed her purse. Mm-hmm. And I said to him, come stand by me because she doesn't know that she doesn't need to fear you. Oh, I didn't do that. Oh, yes, you did. No, what you're not going to do is put that on my child. Okay. He's not trying to steal your purse. So you and your purse stand over there and he's going to stand over here. <laughs> but having to voice it so yeah. that, because he saw it. And I think that that happens so much. It happens with the way, and, and I wonder like, who first thought of this stuff is this is the way we're going to treat children, but how you set them up, how you set girls up, you know, she's bossy, not a leader. Mm-hmm. And we, as women say all the time, oh, I'm so busy. I'm so overwhelmed. Then I stop like, no, no, no. Find another word to say that we're not busy. We're not overwhelmed. We've got a lot on our plate. And we're doing a lot of things. Mm-hmm. If we each had a wife, we would do so much better, okay? <laughs> Men, okay, I've always maintained it has nothing to do with sexuality, okay? I need a wife. If yeah. I had a wife, I'd be wealthy, okay? So you think about that yeah. and, you know, because when women take off to take care of their kids, oh, you got kids, you got to take, hold up. You got kids who stay at home with your kids, your wife. So get yeah. a wife, ladies, get a wife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The military, <laughs> when, we were, when I was in the Navy, well, we always said we wish we had a wife. Yeah, because our life yeah. would be so much yeah. easier if I had a wife. It, it's, Absolutely, it's, we'd be so yeah. much further ahead. Yeah, women, uh, we do things in emails like, "Oh, I'm sorry, I'm delayed in getting back to you," or something. Men don't apologize in their emails, so I always try to make sure I'm aware of that. And um, when um, Obama and uh, Hillary Clinton were 
running against each other. There's a great um, video where they were about to give their do their debate, and um, Hillary says, "I'm so honored to be here with you, Obama." You know, and um, that was just such a woman thing to say, and it's on YouTube. But the the commentator was kind of like, you know, she was sort of like, "What does it mean to say I'm honored?" to be with you. It's a very woman, like, thanks for coming to my house. I'm honored you're at, a, at my party, you know, and like, um, oh, yeah. something yeah. like that. Yeah, it, would, so it, would awesome awesome. it would be awesome to get it. It would be awesome to get an email from a guy who said, I'm so sorry to be late in replying to you. <laughs> yeah, so that's like, it's our that's what they ought to be so doing. Well, you guys, this has been amazing. So it's sad that it's great... only uh, a female trait to be to be courteous. Yes, okay, right. for real. Exactly. Let's exactly. spread that around, right? But it, it's been really great to have you guys here. I have been honored <laughs> to have you here <laughs> on this panel, and it's been such a good conversation, such a rich conversation. And I'm grateful that that all of you joined in and were were willing to share your expertise with us. And the, the cool thing about these is they're recorded. We put them on our website and mm -hmm. people listen to these in, we like to say in perpetuity. I don't know how long perpetuity goes, but there are people who are going to benefit from this very rich yeah. conversation for, for much, much time to come. So anyone have a last parting tidbit of brilliance that you want to share before we wrap it up for the night? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much to all of you for spending your time with us, spending your evening with us. I wish you all good health, good conflict, good outcomes of those conflicts. And we'll see you again next time in the ladies room. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.